welcome to another edition of the Agile Uprising podcast. I have this episode's host, Jay Hersko. And as if you couldn't tell by the intro music, uh, this is an episode in the Game of Frameworks series. And joining us this evening, I have Kurt Bittner and Patricia Kong, both from Scrum.org, to talk about Nexus. So, Kurt and Patricia, thank you for joining me. Hey there. Great to be here. Good pronunciation on the name. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so before we jump in, I want to give you a chance to introduce yourself to our audience who may or may not know who you are. And Patricia, I'm going to start with you. If you just want to give them a quick um, intro as to who you are and how you ended up talking to us, that would be awesome. Great. Yeah. So uh, my name is Patricia Kong. Um, an easy way to remember that is Ding Dong Patricia Kong. And from Boston, Massachusetts, I'm actually, um, I come out of a financial services corporate um, background, but I found myself in the agile and scrum space probably 10 to 15 years ago um, when I was working in France and uh, running, running some tech and startups there. And I've been at Scrum.org for, I think, six years now. And a lot of that has been working on um, kind of new stuff, right? So R&D. And um, I'm the product owner of what we call our enterprise solutions. Uh, work really closely with Kurt. And what we look at generally is, you know, there's stuff going on that's great. Uh, when we look at the team level, how do we expand that to the organization? So that's a little bit about me. And as Patricia said, I'm Kurt. Uh, we work together on various kinds of things, uh, the Nexus book, uh, evidence-based management. And uh, I have a long and sorted background, which we bore everyone to death and use up all of our time if I went through all of it. But um, I've been doing agile things for a long time. Um, before I came to scrum.org, I spent three years as a forester research analyst. And so during that period, I had a a chance to look at a lot of different approaches of what was working and what, and what wasn't working and seeing where the gaps were. And so I had this opportunity to, um, to come to scrum.org and, and work on some of those things. We'll talk a little bit more about what we're doing there. Great, great, thank you. So let's start with, with the first question. So how did both of you come to be involved um, with Nexus? Um, I'll take that. So, oh God, I think about three years ago, um, was when everybody three, four years ago, everybody's talking about scaling, right? So scaling, scaling, scaling in the agile industry. And, um, I remember with Ken, we were saying Ken Schwaber, um, who owns scrum.org and the co-creator of the scrum framework, we were saying, Hey, um, how do you know there's any value in all the scaling that you want to do? And what do you really mean by scaling an organization? So we're looking at that, thinking about, you know, um, kind of measurement stuff and continuous improvement stuff at the organization. And then the scaling conversation really continued. And um, a lot of people seemed confused uh, by the questions that I had asked previously, right, that I just mentioned. And what happened was, um, we felt that two things, right? So one, kind of just looking around with the notion of scaling, we felt that the bottom-up intelligence was getting lost, that which we talk about in Scrum, right? And then um, what we did was say, all right, you want to talk about scaling? Can you, you know, multiple teams work together, get something out the door at the end of a sprint? Can you do that? And let's just talk about, you know, kind of what's been obvious and what's worked. Um, for years, for decades, right, and working with multiple teams, and let's let's formalize that. So that's that's how the um, Nexus framework came to be. Yeah, in terms of, of my background, as I mentioned, I'd been at Forrester, and prior to that, I'd spent about seven, six or seven years helping organizations through these agile transformation efforts, and the combination of those two things drew me to to really the simplicity of Nexus, um, because basically what I found when people talk about scaling, they actually mean a, a number of different things. And we'll, we'll talk later about what Nexus focuses on. But the, the piece that I think people mix together and it's useful to separate is that there's this basically building large products with multiple teams, um, large complex products with, with multiple teams. And, and that's a worthy problem to solve. Um, there's also the problem of organizational and cultural change. And that's really a different kind of problem that you have, whether or not you have large and complex products. So um, the, the, the organizational and cultural change problem is, from my experience, mostly a leadership problem. And it's not really sort of a, a scaling framework kind of problem. So, so I, I like the fact that 
that Nexus focuses on this product problem that Patricia was talking about and preserving all the benefits of Scrum um, and, and not losing that somehow as it gets scaled up. So um, that's, that's what really intrigued me about the framework. Yeah, and I would tag on to one of the, I actually have a hashtag that's associated with me, but we, we talk about, especially at Scrum.org, this notion of don't scale if you don't have to, right? So know what you're doing. Um, and you said I could sw swear, so otherwise it's like taking shit, putting it in front of the fan and spraying, right? So hashtag shit spray. So it's really, it's really trying to not do that also, right? This, this notion of scale can go two ways. Can you descale? You know, thinking about all those different um, options that, that a company may have. Right, right. The, um, the, we had a previous guest talk about the, the use of that word scale because most verbs imply direction. And to your point, when people say scaling, automatically this a lot of times they think upwards and they don't think downwards. Mm. Um, and I think you, had, you, had, you were onto something there, Patricia, when you said uh, bottom, up, bottom up intelligence is getting lost. And I think um, that's a problem that by introducing some of the heavier frameworks, um, people don't realize that they're losing that. They're losing the forest for the trees, which, is, um, which does no one, does no one a service. When you're, when you're so busy worried about, well, how are we doing at the portfolio level that, you know, you forget about the poor people down in the teams that you're actually still expecting to deliver the work. Yeah. And there's, there's been a loss of that. I was actually um, speaking at a conference in Europe um, last year. And one of the questions that I got after talking about Nexus was, um, and I've been, I've been, this has been coming up a lot, but a scrum master asked me, she asked me, what's the difference between scrum and, and, and safe? I don't get it. So right now there's just a misunderstanding, I think, between scrum, between all these different frameworks, between agile, between, you know, what scale is. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit sad. <laughs> there's also something really important about that, that bottom up intelligence. You mentioned, Jay, you mentioned the, the portfolio problem. And one of the interesting things that I ran across when I was working as an analyst is um, a number of different studies which looked at the basically tracing ideas that people had. So, you know, things that tend to go into kind of a portfolio process, ideas that people had and their ability to eventually uh, have a positive impact on something you care about, either customer satisfaction or revenue or market share or, or something like that. And, the, the most interesting of these studies was something that was done um, at Microsoft. They started off with Bing and now they've, they've done all their products, but they, they measured that, you know, sort of idea to result. And what they found was that a third of the ideas, and this is pretty consistent across products. Um, so roughly a third of the ideas produced some sort of positive outcome. A third of the ideas did nothing and a third made things worse. So if you look at that, if you accept that that's true across the industry, and I would personally argue that Microsoft probably does a better, a lot better job at, you know, at, at sort of going to that idea to value than let's say a lot of, you know, big corporations um, that aren't really used to delivering quickly and in rapid cycles. Um, that if you accept that that's true, then that says that two thirds of what people invest in is basically just waste. Um, so that bottom up intelligence ends up being really important for the portfolio decisions too, because you need to get quick feedback on whether this idea is a good one or not. Otherwise you're just dumping money down a hole. And so I think, think preserving that bottom up intelligence and not simply flowing decisions down mm. from executives and portfolio down to teams is super important. Brilliant. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, let me start by asking if you, if you were given the chance to give an elevator pitch, to, to our listeners or to even someone in legitimately in the elevator. Uh, what would your elevator pitch for Nexus be? How could you sum up the, the framework um, in a very quick, succinct statement that would help someone set frame of reference? Oh, boy. You want us to be <laughs> succinct? Um. <laughs> as succinct as possible. So if I, I, if I asked I usually, you... I usually just stare at my shoes and wait till the door opens. <laughs> <laughs> we just kind of nudge each other. I would say... Um, if you are looking to scale the work of multiple teams that are working um, on one product and you'd like to pay attention to uh, lift the transparency around the communication and just really, you know, benefit 
off of using Scrum, that would be Nexus, right? If you already know how to use Scrum and you're working with a few more teams or two more teams, um, we say three to nine, just like a Scrum team, Nexus is your game because you already know how to do it. So when you're looking at the ROI of that, that's what you, that's what you have. So it's, um, that it's, it's, it's really amazing the organizations that I've worked with um, or that are using Nexus. It's, it's primarily, and these are practitioners that are there and people are coming back and say, oh, we're using Nexus. And that's, those are the, that's how I get involved in the conversation. But it's because of the fact that they're using um, Scrum. And then they said, you know what? The stuff that we're building, our lives are already complex. We don't want any more. We know how to do this. Um, and by the way, there's a guide. Um, and it's free, so let's try it that way. That's usually what's been happening. I should have just said free. <laughs> but, free. I mean, but, but to your point, though, it, it, <laughs> it sounds like to me, um, you're basically, people were bootstrapping off their pre-existing knowledge of Scrum and using that to, if they, if they like what they're doing with Scrum, they have the chance to grow it in without necessarily adding a whole bunch of pomp and ceremony and circumstance around it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for the product delivery, absolutely. Okay. Um, so comparatively to, you know, the, the, for everybody, I, I jokingly call it the shirts and certs game, right? Everybody has a framework these days. So what, what do you, what do either of you, this is a toss up question. What do you feel that, um, that, what do you feel that the attributes of Nexus that it has that actually make it stand out in a crowd and make it, make it differentiate, different, a difference, differentiated, I guess, um, is the verb I was looking for from some of the other stuff that's out there. I think to, to leverage what Patricia was saying a moment ago, uh, it's simplicity. Um, you know, it doesn't, you know, we, we've, we've had this conversation with people who, you know, have basically said, you know, they, they can understand what Nexus is doing after a five minute conversation. Now, you know, I mean, there's a little more to it than that, but they can basically understand that, that you know, how, it's different, you know, what, what it adds to Scrum and builds on top of it in, in about five minutes, you can explain a couple things and they go, oh, okay, great, you know. And, uh, you know, we've talked to other people who've gone to four or five day classes for other frameworks and at the end of it, they're still scratching their head about what it is and how they get started. So <laughs> I, I think that, and I'm not, I'm not saying that to diss other frameworks, it might have just been a you know bad instructor or something, but that, I guess <laughs> You're just a constructor. No, but it's it's true though. I mean, as someone who sat through sat through classes um, in different frameworks, I can see where people would walk away scratching their head, especially if. I mean, I, I'm like what I would like to call an experienced practitioner. And even still, there were some concepts for some of the classes I've taken where I kind of did walk away scratching my head, like maybe if I read the book again, it'll make more sense. But I, I think you're I think you're right there. Hmm. Right. Um, One thing I, I noted, sort of, you know, years ago, is that. When you scale something, I, I think a lot of people think that it has to be more complicated because you're dealing with things at a bigger scale. But the reality is because you've got more people that you've got to get on the same page, it has to be just dirt simple. Because if, if it's not, people will just get confused and then they start filling in the blanks for themselves. And pretty soon you've got all these different interpretations and you know, various factions of the religion and, and then religious wars break out and, and every, <laughs> yeah, every right. Time. I think, um, I think that kind of, you know, off of that, it's this notion of accountability too, right? So if we're talking about in Scrum, you know, when we talk about autonomy and all these things, and then all of a sudden we scale and we're taking everything away, that's really um, traumatizing to teams, right? We're going to do this. And all of a sudden, we're going to operate this way. You guys went from releasing, you know, car manufacturers, releasing every two years, and now you're going to go to, you know, every two weeks. That can be traumatizing. So the other way can be, can be um, um, you know, confusing also. So the thing is that is, you know, besides the simplicity, it's, it's just really interesting in terms of um, the notion that when we talk about this being kind of common sense, you know, just a formalization of that and making sure that it's, it's not really paying attention to what structure you're putting in, but really saying this is a network of people working together and how are we going to do that? And you can use that within safer with it, you know, whatever you want, because at the end of the day, what we're saying is you're using Scrum, you're using Nexus, you still need to get product out the door. So let's start now. What do we need? You know, and, and it's, 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 it's approaching it from, from that situation rather than all this upfront planning. 
Okay. Um, so now let's let's go a little bit deeper. So for the listeners that may not be familiar with Nexus and how it functions, can you offer up, um, uh, not like an elevator pitch, but more of what are some of the, the key concepts or some of the, the key attributes that are part of the framework that, that make it as user-friendly um, as it actually sounds? Um, so I would say that there is, if you actually want to talk about using it, there's the Nexus guide, which everybody can download. Um, it's free. But in terms of the, um, the framework, if you're talking about, you know, what does that look like and the notion of implementation? Um, well, one thing is we're looking at one product, right? So you're still multiple teams building up one product. And um, there is this new role that we've introduced. And Role is a bad word, and then also what I'm going to tell you is kind of like a bad description, but it's called the Nexus Integration Team. And why is that? Well, because um, we were really, really focused on the fact that when teams are working together, what can kill them is cross-team dependencies, and they need to pay attention to integration. So what the Nexus Integration Team um, from a simple level is saying, hey, we need a team of people, including the product owner, but a team of people um, who are basically members of the different scrum teams of the Nexus um, that come together and basically they fulfill a role of making sure um, that we're paying attention to integration. The problem is, and Kurt you know, can go into this, they're not necessarily doing any integration and they're not a team, but there's this role that's there to lift the transparency um, to make sure that we're getting the voices heard of all the teams. You wanna tag onto that, Kurt? Yeah, I'll save a little bit of it for the misconceptions part. But a good way to think about this Nexus integration team is that they're a bit like uh, fire wardens. Uh, so, you know, no, no organization has full-time fire wardens who just sit around waiting for a fire, I hope, um, you know, unless they're, you know, the fire company or something. But, um, <laughs> but they, you know, the, the idea is that when an integration problem comes up, the people who are on this large, what's mostly largely a virtual team, um, sort of, you know, sp spring into help. And, and all they really want to make sure is that, you know, in a sense, people are getting the problem solved, um, ideally by themselves. You know, they, so they don't, you, would, you don't want to take any of the self-organization and empowerment away from people. You just want to make sure that if there's an issue that, that's falling between teams and maybe falling between the cracks, sometimes it's sufficient to just basically make everyone aware of it and, and then say, okay, so what, what should we do about this? Maybe it's technical debt creeping up, or maybe it's uh, you know the, the fact that the delivery pipeline isn't really effectively organized anymore. It's not really working, or maybe it's something else. But it's mostly just making sure that there's a focus on getting the issue resolved because it's it's going to you know it's starting to come up usually in the Nexus Daily Scrum that you know it's blocking teams perhaps. Um, so as long as the issue is getting solved, things are good. You know, now sometimes you know it might require people to more you know sort of drop everything and and fix a particular problem, and then it might be some people from the Nexus integration team who do that. So that, that that's you know, the, the main sort of difference, um, you know, a lot of the other activities and, and artifacts are the same, you know, the same ones that you're used to with Scrum, but with, with a little bit different flavor. So sprint planning is a little bit different. The sprint retrospective is a little bit different. Um, but most of the other things are, are the same, and that's why it's easy for people to get started. Okay. Uh, it sounds to me that when you describe this Nexus integration team, it, it is, it's like a, it's like a fire warden crossed with like uh, an air traffic controller, almost crossed with like a conciliary, if you're going to go like to Godfather mm -hmm. reference, right? So they're there to keep pointing out that, hey, you got this, we're noticing this lurking problem. It, it, what are we doing to get around this? What are, how are we solving for it? Um, which I honestly think is pretty powerful because a lot of time, you, especially when you, um, when you try to do, Agile at scale or, 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 or those sort of things, um, you end up with everybody's worrying about their own tree and no one is sitting there saying, hey, the forest is on fire. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're busy <laughs> building their trees as the other side of the, the, other side of the forest is, is slowly turning to ash. Um, right. 
So that's an interesting, that's a really interesting, and I think um, something that probably some of the other frameworks, like it's actually definitely uh, some of the other frameworks that overlook. Um, yeah. so, There's also this notion of the Nexus integration team where they're in a position now, you know, depending who, who, who volunteers, um, but they're also in a position to, um, if you have some really experienced developers there, um, or, you know, even your ex most experienced grandmaster, you're in a really great place to, to coach and to teach. And that is a great way to scale, right? So we're not going to just scale the individuals. We're going we're gonna, to, you know, be working in the teams and trying to coach them and, and help them improve. And that's a great thing to see. Uh, that would, that's one of those things that uh, falls on deaf ears. It's the notion of coaching the team to improve. Um, we, had, we had a whole a series. Uh, we did the dark side of coaching where we talked about everybody's an agile coach these days. And um, we talked about some of the misconceptions and some of the, the damage that a coach can actually do if they're not even, not only just coaching at the wrong level, but putting too much emphasis on one thing over another. Mm. So, when, if, if I am, say, Jay the Agilist, and I'm looking around and my company is, is dipping their toe into the Agile water, they've started doing some scrum, um, and they're looking to start in earnest transforming their org and scaling Agile through the enterprise. So um, when, should, when should I know that Nexus is the one for me? What are, the, what are the things that in the back of my mind as I'm checking off the attributes, I say, ah, Nexus is definitely what we should use in our situation. Um, is there like a, is there like, a, there's never a perfect scenario, but what are some things that um, I as an agilist could be experiencing that should, that I should have in the back of my mind to point me in your direction? Um, I would say that if you are, let me, let me do it this way. So there was Capital One, we have a webinar on this. In Capital One, they use a large, um, well, they use, they use SAFE, right? And what was interesting is that there was um, this group, and they know they had to work, it was going to be a product, they were going to build it, this initiative, and it was going to, um, it was probably going to be more than one team's worth of work. And they had three months left to do it. And they said, whoa, we don't have enough time to do all those other things. And that's not what we're looking for. That's too heavy. We're just trying to get something out the door. You know, multiple teams need to work together and they picked up Nexus. And not only were they able to release and thereafter, they were able to do the first release in less than um, three months, wow. which was when the deadline was. And you know, that's on scrum.org. People can listen to the webinar, but that's an example of, you know, regardless of what's going on around you, if you have a problem where it's just multiple teams working together to fulfill a goal, uh, Nexus, is, Nexus is, is a great place to start. And there's a lot of different ways that Nexus have, has been used. Um, that's an example. There's been examples where it's just a bunch of scrum teams and, you know, they need to kind of have that identity as a Nexus. There's, there's different examples um, even in, um, you know, using it for marketing or agile initiatives or things like that. They're working off one product backlog to hit a goal. So think of it that way. Jay the Agilist. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Uh, there, there's another um, interesting <clears throat> way to look at where does Nexus fit, and it's what I might call the invisible product problem, <clears throat> mm -hmm. and it's this, is where you've got a bunch of scrum teams, and each of those scrum teams is building a component, and ultimately those components have to get integrated into something that gets delivered to customers, but nobody's really responsible for the thing that gets delivered to customers, and so you've got this sort of melange of different you know, component teams and nobody's really focused on the customer and they're all, and they've got, you know, some weirdness, like you've got the, you know, the product owner for the, you know, messaging platform. It's like, and then you've got the product owner for the, you know, data workbench and then the product owner for this, for some other thing, you know, and, and you're like, but who's, who's the product owner for you know, the, the service that's delivered to the customer. It's like, you know, that's just somehow magically happens. <laughs> it's like, but we know, we know it doesn't magically happen and they, they probably get a mess and they're not delivering value. So, so they could bring those teams together in a nexus, have one product owner for the, for the real product and solve this problem by getting better focus on the customer and better focus on getting feedback. And instead of this sort of, fake product owner problem where you've got a product owner for a component mm. it doesn't really make sense. I really think Kurt, you should trademark that the invisible product problem because that is, 
it, it's a very simple way to describe. I, I, I am embarrassed to say that I have seen this in organizations. It's the whole, again, back to everybody's building their forest. Nobody's actually thinking about the tree that actually goes to the customer at the end of the road. Um, powerful. I say it's a very real problem, not yeah. even to be embarrassed because there's so many organizations um, that, that have that and, and they've carried it over. And now we're, we're saying, hey, think about this in terms of value. Yeah. And it's like, oh, well, oh, well, we weren't thinking about that. I was thinking about my component, you know, the, the document management system. That's all I was thinking about. Right. Oof. Oof. Monster there. So what are some common misconceptions around Nexus? What are some things that people may just assume that they, they don't realize that they're, they're actually wrong? And no, that's not true. Well, we talked about one of them earlier, and it's the one I, I summarize is um, the Nexus integration team, it's a great name, except that it's not a team and it doesn't do integration. <laughs> um, so, you know, it, it would have been better if we called it the, you know, the Nexus Fire Wardens or something like that, and then everybody would get it. Yeah, they asked for a Nexus enablement team, but then they'd be the net, and then we'd have a, you know, different discussion. Or, or some, people, some, some of our trainers like to think of it as a, as a coaching team, and it does that too. Yeah, or the but, scrum master to the Nexus, you know, Yeah. Too. But, but the key thing is that it doesn't have to be a physically dedicated team. You know, that sounds like a lot of overhead. And there are circumstances in which you might need that if you, ha you know, but generally speaking, it's not a physical team except under dire emergencies. Um, and most of the rest of the time, you've simply got people who are, you know, sort of helping the, the scrum teams do better. And, and this doesn't take the place of scrum masters. It's just, it's dealing with the cross team issues. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing that we run into. And um, I've actually had some interesting uh, conversations with uh, Boz Vada from uh, of Less. And, um, you know, he, you know, he, he really doesn't like this Nexus integration team. And I understand his reasons. It's, um, but we do find, you know, from our, our standpoint, we do find that it's useful for someone to have accountability for producing the working increment and, delivering a done increment every sprint. And if it doesn't happen, you know, is it the responsibility of the scrum master on team A or on team B or team C or all of the teams? But, you know, if it's everybody's responsibility, then it's nobody's responsibility. So, so you know, we've, we found this is, it's still a useful concept um, despite the, the difficulties we have explaining it. Uh, I think, I think you are onto something because even when I look at, I mean, my experiences are in different frameworks and we still have this problem where everybody, like you said, Kurt, everybody owns it and yet nobody owns it. You know, I mean, there's the, you know, as much as I hate to hearken back to the waterfall days, there was something to be said with the person who had that, um, for lack of a better term, crown of thorns that said, Hey, look, you own this and you need to get it in and you need to work with whomever you need to, to get this out the door. Um, and I can see where the lack of that transparency and even my, my, my personal, uh, my, uh, not my personal life, my God, man, Jay, you're going to start oversharing. Um, in my professional life, I can see where that has, that problem has reared its head. But I think probably rears its head too more often than people want to admit. Yeah. I, I think the other, for me, the other misconception is that you somehow need to water down scrum to scale it. Um, and sometimes this manifests itself in a variety of different ways. Like, you know, we're using scrum, but, you know, we're not doing this. So we're using scrum, but not doing that. We call this scrum, but and it's a, it's a terrible disease. <laughs> yeah. I've been there. I think I've actually worked some places there. Yep. Yep. <laughs> exactly. And, and so, you know, that, that notion that you have to water it down or you have to adapt it to your organization and the roles in your organization. And actually the, the reverse is true is that you, the problem is the culture and the organizational structure that exists already. Um, and so watering Scrum down to sort of, you know, make the product owner into a business analyst or, you know, make the Scrum master into a project manager. But, you know, they're, and they're still doing project manager -y kinds of things, but they're just called a Scrum master now. I mean, that's, that's you know, but, but, you know, organizations say that and say, oh, we're big, you know, we couldn't possibly change the work in the Scrum way. And it's like, no, it's really simple, you know, but you have to let go of what you already know and, Feel comfortable with and, and maybe even recognize that that current way of working is actually part of the problem that you're trying to fix right right and you had a quote early on Kurt where you said um, organizational and cultural change is a leadership problem not a scaling problem and I really think that sometimes 
uh, it's been my observation, uh, especially talking with other coaches and other practitioners, that organizations somehow convince themselves that, hey, if we just use this, this scaling framework, we're going to solve all of our problems. They almost look at it like it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a magic, uh, magic bean. Mm. And it's, that's never the case. And, and I mean, we all know that the, the cultural change that comes along with this way of working and the, the organizational, even informal networks and structure and reporting, that's a much bigger nut to crack. And, if, and my first Agile coach I ever worked with told me that Agile doesn't solve your problems. It amplifies them and, and brings them out into the forefront. And sometimes I think there are some consultants out there that don't tell that to the customer and it's actually a disservice. Yeah, I think the interesting thing is, I mean, we talked about misconceptions about Nexus, but the kind of larger, well, the larger conversation is what are the common misconceptions about scaling, about agile? And uh, a lot of people will think about, well, how is this going to give me an agile transformation, right? I get called on LinkedIn all the time and HR will ask me, you know, from a, a company, how many, how many agile transformations you've done? And because I'm cheeky, I say, well, how many times have you lost five pounds? And it's, it's, it's this notion, right? And it's this notion of like, Nexus isn't there to do that. If you're talking about delivering value, if you're talking about how to become more agile, yeah, so start small, right? This is how we're going to do it. Right. And what I've seen um, with, with some companies, um, and they've done the list from too, but I worked with a company where they went stealth and they started using Nexus and then they had some, you know, data to show back to management. And that's when, you know, they were like, oh, okay, let's try, let's try this now. We're seeing you've been getting some, some results and you guys tried that yourself, which was a beautiful thing, right? This bottom up intelligence that works. Now they're going to spread it, you know, to other areas in a company and that's agility, right? So it's, it's interesting. That's actually true agility, right? And that's the way it, that you're almost not guaranteed to succeed, but if you try it as almost, we called it, what do we call it? Undercover agile or gorilla, gorilla scrum, right? Mm. Just doing it. We know we need to change because what we have isn't working. Let's try this new way. And then you end up with the arithmetic proof, not just anecdotes. You end up with the arithmetic proof that, look, we did this thing, and now we're delivering at a quicker clip, and the quality's there, and the customer's happy, and it's exactly what they want. Let's expand it to the enterprise. It's that whole, you know, scale down, the scale up sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So let me ask the two of you, what, what does the future hold for Nexus? Um, and I'm not asking for product roadmaps, but what, what's coming around the corner? What are some of the things that you're currently investigating or experimenting with um, that somebody could be on the, should be on the lookout for? Um, so in the long run, I, my desire, my hope is that Nexus is really just as common as Scrum, right? Common sense. Um, around the corner, so we have a two-day class that's called Scaled Professional Scrum, uh, Scaling Professional Scrum with Nexus, and there's a certification and all that stuff. But the development that's going into it is really around this section that we call Nexus Plus, which is, you know, generally one Nexus is three to nine teams. What does it look like when you have um, more than that, right? So how do you deal with multiple nexus working together? So we're doing um, we're doing more development on that just as you know as our experience is developing too and we can work with clients. So we're going to have a lot more around that and obviously there's a lot more complexity there. So you know we'll talk about what do you do when you have platform? How do you do with multiple products? What does this look like? Um, obviously what do you what happens when you have um, teams in different locations? How will we talk about that? So that'll be development that's in the um, in the class. Awesome. Awesome. There's some, there's another thing that Patricia and I also work on um, and it'd be worth a, another podcast sometime, but uh, it's called evidence-based management and it deals with the problem that every organization has, whether they're scaling or not. And that is how do we know whether we're actually delivering value and then how do we improve our ability to deliver value over time? So, um, so it's an evidence-based management a framework. We, there's a, a guide to it. It's also on scrum.org. Um, but we're doing additional work on that. Um, we're um, taking some of the ideas and uh, starting to look at how to extend them into more of a lean portfolio management um, space. Uh, so, you know, one of, the, one of the big problems that organizations have, uh, and, and this is created by their, their portfolio management processes, is in a sense, they charter too much work. So they end up with too much work in process to use the lean terminology. And what that does is that it forces teams to start multitasking between, in a sense, different products, which causes them to lose focus, which causes them to delay their delivery cycles and all these other things. So if, if we could get organizations to simply focus on, you know, only feeding 
only, you know, in a sense, having the, the teams themselves pull the work and they only take on as much work as they, as they have capacity to work on. And you focus on ordering the opportunities that they work on and then they, they choose what they're best suited to do. It's a much better way to flow the work, but, you know, then we get into lots of political problems and all that. So we're not, you know, this is pretty early. Um, but some organizations work this way and, and it actually works really well. Mm, if you'll allow me to rant for two seconds. Um, so when we talked about Nexus, when we were looking at the development of that, um, what, what Kurt just mentioned, um, evidence-based management, EBM, actually came prior to that. So when organizations were doing scaling, 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 we're going to invest millions of dollars, we're going to do that now, da, 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 da. we said, how do you know this is even making you better? What value are you getting out of this? So that's the um, genesis of, of evidence-based management for us. Um, and the interesting thing is that, you know, going further beyond this layer of scaling, we do not know. And so it's hard to say here is, you know, a framework you should think about because all organizations are different. We don't know your, your legacy code. We don't know your architecture. We don't know your politics. We don't know all those things. So if you think about what is the, 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 the lightest thing that we could put in there in an organization that was Nexus. And then we said, what's most important is that you measure value, the value you're getting out of that so that you know how to be empirical and what steps you might try to uh, take next. I am definitely going to have you both back on to discuss that because that's, that's right in the warehouse of some of the stuff we're um, uncovering in a different almost podcast series. So that's, that's fantastic. Um, and now you got me thinking, Kurt, when you made the remark that sometimes people as part of their LPM or they're, they're chartering too much work. Um, I think that's a problem that probably more orgs see but don't even realize that they're doing it. Uh, probably because, you know, they're used to the waterfall way where uh, Patricia's budget is an amount of millions, uh, Kurt's is X, Jay's is Y, and then they start spinning up all these charters to suck up all that budget. And then you mm -hmm. end up with all this stuff in your – um, queue or backlog, whatever you want to call it. And are you going to get it all done or you're not going to get it all done? What if six months from now the market drastically changes? And then you, now you have all this, for lack of a better term, this, this junk that you're going to have to sort through to say, is this still valid? Why? And you end up creating more work for yourself. And that's a political and cultural problem, right? Because if I don't take that budget, I'm not as important. And if I don't use it all, then I'm not going to get the budget next year. So there's so much in that. But right. how important you are by how many people you manage and how much budget you have. Exactly. It's like that one road in my town, they keep paving every year. And my, my wife does not get why they keep paving it every year. And I said, you know, they have to use up their budget or they're not going to get it again. And she said, well, isn't there anything else they can pave? I said, all right, now we're getting into some, some deeper level stuff that I really don't want to end up us screaming at each other. But you're absolutely right. That's the rational way to look at it. Um, last question for the both of you. So if our, if our listeners, if our audience wants to learn more about Nexus, where do they go? What, where should they view? Who should they contact? What should they do? They can contact her. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and my home phone number is. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, so um, the first place to go, I would suggest, is to the scrum.org website. And when you go to our resources section, there's a part on scaling scrum. Um, so there are case studies there, there are white papers, you know, for instance, how do you do a cross team refinement workshop? You know, what does sprint, Nexus sprint planning look like? Um, so there's the case studies, there's the Nexus guide. Um, they'll learn more about the class. So the class that in itself that I mentioned the two days that that is a class that walks you through Nexus in terms of what does it feel like to be in the in an actual Nexus, right? How do we go through those events together? Um, we've done tons of webinars on it. There's webinars that we've done just talking about an intro to Nexus, which I've done. There's webinars um, that I've done around um, you know talking to different customers and clients, how they've implemented Nexus. So those are good places. And obviously, um, Kurt, if you want to talk about the book, uh, we, we published a book on it. Yep. It's called the Nexus Framework for Scaling Scrum. Uh, it's nice and short. Um, takes a case study approach. So uh, actually, one of the chapters more or less um, repeats the guide. But, uh, but then it takes a case study approach looking at typical problems that teams face when they're trying to scale. And um, Pretty short, easy read. Um, a lot of positive comments about it. So, um, you know, I'd say start with the guide, start with the resources that Patricia mentioned. Then, the book is a good next uh, next place to look. 
Yeah, the book and also on the site, I forgot um, that you just reminded me is the nexus is the framework, right? There's tons of practices that may or may not help you. And those we call out in the book, um, you know, as this, as this team, as this nexus kind of goes through and hit different challenges. And we've also published them on the, on the Scrum Network site. So you can say, hey, you might think about this practice when, you know, this scenario hits you. Perfect, perfect. Thank you both. Um, and as we wrap it up, I wanted to give you a chance if you have anything you'd like to share, um, any upcoming courses you're teaching, conferences you'll be speaking at, um, any upcoming uh, Nexus events that you want to get in our listeners' ears, um, I'll give you the floor to go ahead. Oh, should I go first? <laughs> <laughs> Um, first things first, this is, I know you're doing a series on game of frameworks and I finally feel I've never, I've only watched two episodes of game of Thrones. Um, so I think I better start kind of binge watching game of Thrones to, to kind of be part of the, the, the present time. Um, but I am, um, I don't teach publicly often. We do workshops, um, generally with implementations, a lot of stuff around the, um, things we're working on or developing currently for product development. So um, you may or may not see, um, but the best way to see is Scrum.org on Twitter, um, social media, mine or Scrum.org. Generally, if I'm teaching publicly, it'll be on something like evidence-based management. Uh, we might be doing workshops. I am speaking at a bunch of different places. Um, and I think in April, I am going to be in Agile Boston. I think in May, I'm doing Agile Hartford. May I'm doing Agile Munich in Germany. Um, I'm keynoting at Scrum to Europe in Amsterdam. So there's a lot of places that you can find me. Um, and the best way is just to see the social media of Scrum.org because um, I don't have it listed um, anywhere specifically. But you can always email me. Remember, ding dong Patricia Kong. So <laughs> patricia.kong at Scrum.org or just hit me on Twitter. Great. And, Thanks, uh, Patricia. How about you, Kurt? Um, I've got a couple things coming up. I'm actually pretty busy. We're working on a, a book series, and so I'm editing that. But uh, the speaking events, I'm speaking at something called the Silicon Valley Scrummit in, uh, in March, um, March uh, 22nd. Uh, and then there's, uh, I'm also keynoting at Agile Israel um, in May. Uh, I can't remember the date, uh, 22nd, I think. Um, and also doing a, a sort of an abbreviated evidence-based management workshop. Um, so those are the, the two that are coming up in the next couple of months. Great, great. So uh, to take us home, on behalf of the Agile Uprising and all of our listeners, uh, Patricia and Kurt, I want to thank you very much for taking time uh, out of your evenings to speak with us. And on behalf of Patricia, Kurt, and myself, I'd like to thank all of you listeners for listening. If you enjoyed the episode, please give us a review, a rating, leave a comment on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, your podcasting platform of choice, as it does help others find us. Uh, there will be a thread about this podcast and the, the Game of Framework series itself posted on coalition.agileuprising.com. So feel free to hop in and join the discussion. And lastly, we do have a Patreon set up for those that are feeling generous and would like to help offset some of our hosting and production costs. So see the show notes for details on that and how you can become a patron. So again, uh, Kurt, Patricia, I can't thank you enough. Um, I'm really glad that we got you on. I'm really looking forward to getting this out in front of our listeners. Um, and until next time, this is the Agile Uprising Podcast signing out.